So welcome back. Let's start with a quick review of what we talked about in the last video. So we had understood that sound waves correspond to longitudinal waves traveling through air or another medium. And we had this picture of how that worked where certain regions of the air had a higher density of molecules and certain regions have a lower density of molecules. And th this combination of things would represent a pulse of sound through the air. And what we understood was that the forces, because of the air molecules, are such that this thing wants to propagate to the right like a traveling wave pulse in just the same way that we had traveling wave pulses on the slinky or in our example with the masses and the springs. So let's remember the physics behind why these wave pulses want to travel. And so the basic idea that we need to use is that gases like air exert forces on whatever is surrounding them. So if you have air and you have a wall, then the air is exerting significant forces on the wall because of the collisions of the molecules of air with the wall. And we understood that the concept of pressure just keeps track of how big those forces are going to be. So the forces are going to be larger if you look at a larger area of the wall. And so it's usually convenient to take the force produced by the air per unit of area, and that is the quantity that we call pressure. So the pressure is like the force per unit of area. That's going to be a number which is cons usually constant or almost constant throughout your room or outside. There's a specific air pressure that is more or less the same everywhere. And then if you want to figure out how much force is that air exerting on a certain area like the top of your head, you just multiply the area by the pressure. So for our application to understanding sound waves, one of the important things about pressure is that it is going to increase when you get a higher density of molecules, meaning that if you have more molecules per volume, then you're going to get a higher pressure. And that's simple to understand because the pressure is coming from these collisions. If you have mo more molecules, you're going to get more collisions, and so you're going to get a larger force. So let's see how this impacts our understanding of the dynamics of these air molecules when you have some molecules that are initially displaced. Okay, so if I, if I clap or do something else to make a sound, maybe I have a vibrating object, then what that does is it pushes some air molecules into nearby locations. And so that is indicated in this picture where we have this region here with less air molecules than there used to be. Those air molecules have been displaced to the right. And so that creates a region where we have a higher density of air molecules. And so the first thing that we can see is that in this situation, we're going to have a restoring force that tends to bring those displaced air molecules back to where they were. So you see, thinking about this collection, we'll think of this entire um, layer of air here that I have drawn in the rectangle. So if we think about the forces on that layer of air, then the higher pressure or the higher density of air molecules on the right will lead to a higher pressure and therefore a greater force pushing to the left as compared to the left side of this rectangle where you have a lower density and therefore a lower pressure and therefore a lower force. And so if I think about that layer of air that has the displaced molecules in it, there's going to be a net force to the left and so that will act like a restoring force. We displace some molecules to the right, there's a net force on those back to the left, just like in our other examples, just like the mass on the spring. Now, the next part of our understanding is that while those molecules are displaced to the right, they are also going to exert forces on the next layer of molecules. 
So we've moved on to the right a little bit here and we're considering this next layer of air. And what you see is that for this next layer, now the pressure is greater on the left side than it is on the right side. And so you're going to get a net force to the right and that will push the next layer of air molecules causing those to be displaced to the right. And then that will mean that you'll get a new region where you have a higher density of air molecules and a higher pressure. And then that just continues on in the same way. And so altogether, you end up getting this propagation of the sound wave pulse, starting with some initial event like hitting this hi-hat or a clap, which causes some of the air molecules to be displaced and creates a higher density region. Okay. So I have a quick uh, video recommendation. I'll put the link below if you want to see a visualization of that. So there's a special technique with light that it allows you to actually see the regions with higher air density and lower air density. And so if you wanna go and check out the video below, you can actually see the propagation of some sound waves associated with a speaker or a clap or a firecracker going off. Okay, so I want to just come back to our general picture. So this is a picture of my artist's rendition of, of air molecules in a wave pulse that comes from a one-time event like a clap or a hi-hat hit. And we see that for later times, the pulse travels further away from the origin. And now what I want to imagine is that our ear, which is, well, let's imagine it's connected to our head, but I've just drawn the ear. Uh, let's say that's somewhere and the wave pulse is approaching the ear. Okay, and I so I want you to think for a little bit, maybe pause the video, just about number one, uh, what does the air pressure look like at the location of the ear as a function of time? So make a time graph of that air pressure. And then number two, think about what physical effect will that air pressure have on, on the ear? or maybe in particular on the eardrum, which is this membrane inside the ear. Okay, so let's talk about that. Uh, what we have is some air pressure, which is more or less uniform, except for in the region around the sound wave pulse. Okay, so if we think about uh, a graph of this thing as a function of time, well, it's going to be constant for a while until the air, until the sound wave pulse reaches the ear. Uh, then it, we'll see this region of higher density, so the pressure will go up. After that, we'll see the region of lower density, so the pressure will go down a little bit and then back up to the original value. Okay, so overall, what we expect is that when this wave pulse hits our ear, this is what the air pressure in the vicinity of our ear is going to look like. So what is the physical effect of that? Well, we should remember that the pressure, that is what tells us how much force the air from the outside of our ear is going to exert on, in this case, the eardrum. Okay. And so what we see is that this outside force from the outside air, it temporarily increases and if we imagine that there's some force on the other side of the eardrum which is staying the same just based on the pressure of our inside inside the ear being the same as the outside um, then temporarily what you have is a slightly larger force from the outside and so that's what i've shown here the larger pressure on the outside that you get when the pulse arrives is going to temporarily lead to a net force that pushes your eardrum inward a little bit and then shortly after that, the outside pressure is going to be less. And so then there's a net force that will, um, that will push your eardrum back out. And so we might imagine that when this pulse arrives, then the, the eardrum just has some oscillation. Okay. So the sound wave is caused by some original event. It travels through the air and then it causes 
through this uh, effect of the pressure, it causes our eardrum to vibrate. Okay, and then that is ultimately what leads to our perceiving the sound. So we'll talk later about the physiology of the ear and how the motion of the eardrum uh, translates into us hearing a sound. Um, but for now, this is, this is the basic thing that we want to understand. Okay. So just to kind of wrap that up, um, so this is our general picture of how sound waves are produced and travel through the air and then affect our ear. I uh, just want to kind of review a couple of things about how we represent these sound waves and how different examples of different sounds would be different physically. And so one way that we had for representing the information about a wave and what kind of wave it is, is the idea of a snapshot graph. And so I've displayed that for our particular wave pulse in this slide here. What we had was that some of the air molecules were displaced to the right, and, and that, is, that effect is largest right in this region here, right at this point. Um, and so if I were to plot the displacement of air molecules to the right versus the position, it will look something like this. So we know that over here and over here, there's no net displacement in the middle region, there is some displacement, and probably this displacement is a smooth function of position, so it probably goes up and down. So there's some air molecules here that are displaced a little, then the next ones are displaced more, and then it less again, and then no displacement. Okay. So that's your snapshot graph of displacement versus position for a particular time. Just to remind you, when we were talking about longitudinal waves, this graph actually represented the displacement in a direction perpendicular to the direction that the wave is moving. Now it's representing to the displacement in that same direction, the left-right direction. One more graph that we could make that's similar to a snapshot graph is like a snapshot graph of the pressure versus position. And so this is something like what we just talked about, except instead of looking at the pressure versus time at the location of the ear, we can just look at the sound wave at some instant and show how the pressure varies with space. So these are two different representations of the behavior of our sound wave at an instant in time, either showing how the air molecules are displaced or showing how the air pressure varies as you move along this horizontal direction. So that was all for the example of a single wave pulse caused by an event like a clap. We could also consider waves that are produced by oscillating systems. And so instead of this system just adding energy into the sound wave all at once, this thing is oscillating and so it is displacing air molecules and then displacing them again and then displacing them again. And so it's almost like a series of these wave pulses that will be created. And they'll all be moving away from the original source. And so just like the last example, we can again look at what does the displacement graph look like in that case. And here is where you get your classic kind of sinusoidal graph associated with a sound wave. So if it happens that the source of your sound wave is something that is exhibiting simple harmonic motion, like this tuning fork, then that will cause the air to be displaced in a periodic way. And then the profile of the wave or the snapshot graph of displacement versus position will also look like a sinusoidal wave. Okay, so we can just understand that from the picture of the air molecules, you see that in this region, some of the air molecules here are displaced to the left, so negative displacement. The ones here are displaced to the right, positive displacement. Um, and then the ones right in the middle here are not displaced at all, and the ones right in the middle here are not displaced at all. And so that's why the displacement graph looks like that. So those were snapshot graphs. 
And then the other way that we had for representing the information about waves was the history graph, making a graph of the displacement of the air at a particular location as a function of time. Okay, and so this is the most important kind of representation when we are thinking about what will we hear as the result of a sound wave. Because what we hear basically, as I mentioned before, depends on what is the displacement of our eardrum as a function of time. And that will be very similar to the displacement of the air at, our, at the location of our, of our ear. Okay. And so this is just an example um, in that case of a single wave pulse of what the air displacement at the location of our ear might look like as a function of time. Okay. We expect just a brief period where the displacement changes where it's non-zero and we expect it to be large and then maybe quickly go, go small again. So that's what I've indicated here. Uh, we're going to see some example of this in a demo coming up. Um, the other case would be the displacement versus time at the location of our ear for a periodic kind of motion that causes sound waves. And then in that case, instead of just a one-time event here, you could get an oscillation that happens back and forth and back and forth, and it continues as long as the object producing that sound wave continues oscillating. Okay. So you, you might have some kind of a, time, a displacement versus time graph like this. And here I've indicated that uh, this is a very fast oscillation because it's coming from a tuning fork, which oscillates very rapidly. Okay, so these are two examples of what the displacement versus time graph might look like for two different kinds of sounds. So the thing I want to end this video with is the idea that when we are thinking about different kinds of sounds and what like mathematically or from a physics perspective distinguishes these different kinds of sounds, it's basically these time graphs of the sound of the displacement versus time at the location of our ear. Okay, so this graph or this graph, that is essentially the entire information that will determine what we hear. Okay, so, so whether you're listening to a single drum beat or a tuning fork or an entire orchestra, the sound that is produced when it comes to our ear that's just displacing the air in a particular way as a function of time, this displaces our eardrum in a particular way as a function of time. And so the entire information about what sounds we're hearing, it's just captured in one of these time graphs of displacement versus time. There is no other information um, that, that we would need uh, to know. Okay. So, that's all for this video. In the next video, I'm going to just do some demonstrations to show you examples of actual time graphs of various sounds. So we'll do, we'll do an experiment and we'll see what these things look like for regular sounds, for musical notes. And then we're going to start understanding how different properties of these time graphs correlate with the different properties that sounds can have.